Galatians chapter 3. We'll look at verse 12. Okay, now this verse should be actually used as a powerful argument against good works for salvation. So one of the best ones is Romans chapter 11, verse 6, Romans chapter 4, and then you, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 12 is also one of the best ones against good works. These are the top three. And the law is not, is not, is not of what? Now, did you get the memo there? Yeah. Now, this is important because this is not just Seventh-day Adventists or people who are binding you to Old Testament practices. This also includes a group of people who teach lordship salvation. So, you notice how I stress against these guys so often. Lordship salvation is something popularized by John MacArthur, but it is a Calvinist doctrine from back then. So this is one of the last five points in Calvinism. It came from the P of TULIP, which is perseverance of the saints. Lordship salvation, they believe this. If you, so we believe salvation by faith, not works. Okay. If you believe in that, then you shouldn't have no works at all. No, if you do have real faith, real faith will have works. Now, does this make sense? No. Faith not works, but if you really have faith, then it will have works. Ah, if they say real faith, listen up now. You'll see this quite often. Real faith, active faith, um, not a dead faith, but genuine faith, true faith. When you hear these terms, don't let that scare you. True faith is faith. True faith is not works. No, it, uh, true, real faith will have works coming out. No, did you read this verse? And the law is not of what? Faith. You got rid of the definition. Calvinists, they all mark about the five solas. And one of the, their solas is faith alone, faith alone, faith alone. And then you tell them this. No, you don't believe in that. So you tell that Calvinist who accuses you for not knowing Calvinism, you tell them this. You know, for all your big talk, it seems like you're the one that don't even know the basic of Calvinism. Yeah. Smart Alec, smart Alec, idiots, these Calvinists, make me stinking mad. Oh, pastor, you're just angry. Listen to them argue in the debate. Then you'll know what I mean, okay? You'll understand what I mean. They all have their way of sneaky slying, making up terminologies, giving five different interpretations for one term, which is why it's not a problem for them to make up five different words, Greek or Hebrew definitions for one word, five more different versions for a King James Bible wording, because they live their life living by themselves as the final authority. And they used a lot of free will to do that as well. Yeah, that's good. Wicked evil people. So these people right here is that they're going to argue that real faith will consist of works. But no, you read that verse, the law is not of faith. So real faith does not consist of works. Get it? Did you guys get that? That should be common sense. But no, these people will squirrel their way around it. And they'll squirrel their way around it that you get lost and you don't even know half of what they talk about. So then what you need to do is that you just pull them up one verse and see how they argue against that. And when they weasel their way out of it, you just tell them this. You just look at them like they're stupid and say, the law is not Amen. a faith. Amen. Amen. Oh, the Greek and Hebrew word, the law is not a faith. Amen. These people, man, just make you stinking angry, these Calvinists. So lordship salvation is a heretical doctrine that we oppose. Amen. This is a heresy that should be avoided. This has poisoned Christian churches today and ruined everybody. Right. In fact, the, if you want to know the popular Christian ministries who reach people with the gospel, it is those who are influenced by lordship salvation. One of the most famous people, Ray Comfort. Uh, creationist organizations are getting influenced by this too, such as Ken Ham. And then we also the popular Calvinists such as Todd Friel from the Wretched Channel. Yeah, his channel is wretched, no surprise right there. Then we got John MacArthur, he's an oldie. And Paul Washer is one of the worst people you ever heard on this other side of the universe right here. Yeah. Paul Washer makes you think you're not saved when you listen to his sermons. 
Paul Washer. So he needs a lot of washing up on his doctrine, bless God. So these guys, these have done so much damage to the church. So watch out when you hear these guys talk. They stress a lot about repentance, and they seem to have a negation toward the sinner's prayer. When you hear those kind of two warning lights, you better watch out for those guys. These guys are stressing so much about some kind of Holy Spirit convicting you. But if you're to use your head, who teaches that about you have no free choice to do the matter yourself, but some, some, you got to have some God somehow to force you somehow to do it. That's Calvinism. That's Calvinism. All right, let's keep reading right here. The, verse 12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth, in, doeth them shall what? Live in them. So if, the, if your Seventh-day Adventist friend insists <clears throat> that your life should be by the law, the law is never separated from your life, then you have to give him an ultimatum. It's either the law or faith. That's what you got to tell that person. There's no, uh, there's no other option. It's either law or you live by faith. It's not fa real faith that produces things from the works of the law. Fully, who, who made that up? Do you see that in your Bible? Whenever they come up with these sly terms, ask them this. This is very useful as an argument when they come up with sly, clever arguments. Can you give me a verse on that? Where does the Bible say that? Or did you just make that up just now? Tell them that. Here's another way you can tell them, okay? This, this works a lot of time. I like to see them do this, okay? I would like to talk to three scholars and talk to them in a separate room. And you know what I would like to do? I would like to tell this one scholar after he defines his term, I'm going to say, uh, your friend so-and-so over there, though, he said this about what real faith is. It seemed to contradict your definition. And then I'll go to that next scholar over there and say, well, you know, so-and-so mentioned this is a definition, so he seemed to disagree with you. And then I'll go to the third one. And you know what? These guys can't agree in a defi definition. You know why? Because they're used to making up an argument and a term. I would like to get them all in, a, in separate rooms and see and hear their Greek interpretation. They think that I'm unintellectual, I'm biased, I'm narrow-minded. No, I'm going to prove you're biased. I'm going to prove you're narrow-minded when I separate you scholars and talk to you in separate rooms. I would like to do that. So you can do that too. Just tell a Jehovah Witness, you know, you're the first Jehovah Witness I ever heard giving that kind of interpretation. Pastor Shrive used that, and the Jehovah, Wit the Jehovah Witness he was talking to just was quiet after that. Use that kind of argument on them. Put pressure on them. Put pressure on them, these guys. Don't let them intimidate you, okay? Don't, okay, why, why are you harping on these guys, Pastor? Because I know how intimidating these guys can be to you. So keep in mind that what you can do is, one, keep insisting, where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say that? Or did you make that up just now? When you keep giving them a burden of they made it up just now, that pressures them. And then you'll see their weak side coming out. Second thing, accuse them that they're the first one you ever heard giving that kind of interpretation. They'll pressure them. Say, no, I heard scholar so-and-so giving a different one right there. Okay, let's keep reading here. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So praise the Lord, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he delivered us from the curse of the law. Let's keep reading right here. Being made a curse for us, Jesus Christ became our curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So when you hang on a tree, it is considered to be a curse. So this is very important to understand. These are two powerful arguments right here. So one argument right here is that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, correct? Now Seventh-day Adventists, they don't like it when you keep insisting that when Jesus Christ died on the cross... That what the cross did is that it negated the law. It got rid of the law. So that will be found at Colossians. I'll show you that verse real quick. Keep your hand here. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Now when you look at this passage, this verse completely undoubtedly shows that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, this salvation got rid of the law. Seventh-day Adventists hate that argument. So what they try to insist is that in Colossians chapter 2, the cross, it did not get rid of the law, it got rid of our sins. That's what they'll insist. It got rid of a record of our sins, not a record of the law. That's what they're going to insist. So look at Colossians chapter 2. 
We'll read verse 14. Blouting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's the law. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his what? Cross. See, the cross got rid of the law. But what your Seventh-day Adventist friend is going to insist is that the first part of verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, is not the law, but it's a record of your sins at verse 13. See that? 13, sin is mentioned. That's what they're going to argue. But here's the thing. That's not true because Galatians, then all you have to do is just use Galatians 3.13. When Christ died on the cross, what did he get rid of? Your sins here or did it say law? It said law. Galatians 3.13 told you when Jesus died on the cross, he got rid of the law, not your sins. So if you don't want to use Colossians 2, then use Galatians 3.13. See how they stand up against that. They can't. So Christ delivered you from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. So notice right here when Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, that means he had to fulfill the law himself. That's why Seventh-day Adventists, their favorite argument is this. Jesus Christ said, I came not to break the law, but to what? Fulfill, right? Now here's the thing. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he got rid of the law. But when he got rid of the law, that did not break the law. Did that make any sense just now or that was confusing? So that's what the Seventh-day Adventists will, will try to get on you. Well, then that's just totally contradictory. What did Jesus Christ mean when he said, I came not to break the law. I didn't break the law, but I fulfilled. The easy answer is this. Je Jesus Christ in Galatians 3.13 took what? The law, the curse of the law upon himself. So he had to fulfill it. He had to complete all the things that the law had upon himself. That's why he got rid of the law for us. Breaking the law? No, he did not break it. He completed it. But by completing it, the law became void to us. What does fulfill mean? Fulfill means to complete, right? If it's completed, does that mean there's anything extra that we need to make up for it? Boom, you got the Seventh-day Adventist. So you tell them this. No, we don't believe in breaking it. It's fulfilled. That's right, fulfilled. So you got to keep the law. Oh, did it say Christ fulfilled the law or we fulfilled the law? If Christ fulfilled, fulfill means complete. That means there's an end. That's why the law is an end to us. See how a Seventh-day Adventist weasel his way out of that one. So this is, this is what you need to keep in mind. Because Galatians 3.13, that's a good verse you got to mark down against Seventh-day Adventist. He took the curse of the law upon himself. So he had to complete it, fulfill it for us. Another thing from this verse is that, notice that it says, For it is written, so he's quoting from a verse, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, and then we'll read verse 23. For it is written. So Paul's quoting a verse right here. Notice that if you violate some things of the, of the law, God demanded that you were supposed to be hung. You were supposed to hang on a tree. So think about this. Why did Jesus Christ choose the death of the cross? You got to think about that. Because the law of Moses demanded being hung on a tree, if, you, if you're going to take something where it breaks the law, some kind of curse of sin upon yourself, the penalty was being, hang, being hung on a tree. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse... 22, we'll start at verse 22. And if man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou, what? Hang him on a tree. Look at verse 23. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is what? A curse of God. So this is very important to understand, which a lot of Christians don't think about. They can't overlook this. So you got to realize that 
hanging on a tree, which is what Jesus did, amen? Jesus hung on the tree, that cross. So you understand this. This cross is not supposed to be a symbol of some kind of prosperity and blessing. It's like these Catholics, they keep kissing the crucifix because they feel like they're going to get some kind of lucky charm out of it. It's like all these Christians, they have to have some cross and then wiggle it like they're wiggling some rabbit's foot or, you know, some four-leaf clover so that they can rub off some charm off of it. But it's actually the opposite. This is not a fortune cookie, okay? If you have a fortune cookie that looks like that, I would advise that you don't eat it. <laughs> this is not a fortune cookie. This is actually a misfortune cookie. This is actually a cursed thing. It's not supposed to bring you good luck. It's supposed to bring you curse. It's supposed to bring you bad luck. So that's why it's important to understand. That's why we, don't, we do not believe in hanging crosses in our church. That's why you'll notice that. Now, we don't get nitpicky either, okay? I mean, you see some of our hymn books. They have a cross symbol in front of it. I mean, what are we going to do? Put scotch tape all over, you know, all of them and stuff like that. So, you know, not only that, in the car that you're driving, the, the, you guys don't know this, but the symbols in the cars that you're driving, those are pagan wicked symbols too. You'd be surprised. Me and Robert just started to do some jokes one time. We're like saying, you know, I bet you that's a pagan symbol. And when we Googled it, yeah. guess what? It was a pagan symbol. It was a cursed symbol. Yeah. It's like I can't move my fingers at all anywhere. Yeah. You know why? Because anything I do, it'll be a, fa it'll be a pagan cursed symbol that you will find online. Yeah. Now, some of you notice that I keep doing, you know, the okay sign a lot, you know, like trying to make it perfect. And then people try to connect me to 666. I mean, for crying out loud, man, for crying out loud. There's no freedom what you can do nowadays. Amen. Yeah. I can't do anything. Wow. Do you know how many times I did the 666 symbol doing like this, you know, while drawing on a whiteboard? For crying out loud, I guess all my drawings are of Satan then. So, see, you got to realize, so we're not nitpicky either, okay? So you got to understand that fact. We're not nitpicky either. But neither do we try to put this all, we, neither do we embellish this either. A Christian life is a matter of balance that is so important to understand. Satan always uses two extremes where it either burdens a Christian or whether it hurts somebody else. So you got to realize this. This is actually a cursed symbol. So if you're wearing a cross around your neck, here's good advice for you. Don't have that, period. This one right here, because the verse is cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Why do you have some, something that hangs around your neck, a cursed symbol? So that's why we don't believe in this. So we don't believe in crosses. So that's why we avoid crosses. By the way, you got to realize this. What was the cross? What was the Roman cross back then? Even without Bible, do you know what the Roman cross was back then? You know why they chose specifically a cross? Because it was specifically for a pagan symbol. It even all the way goes back to Egypt, they use this kind of symbol. So you got to realize this. This is something pagan. That's why Jesus chose this. Do you see that? Jesus loved you so much that he put wickedness and curse upon himself. That should touch your heart, how much Jesus Christ loved you. And you think God should love you more when he hasn't been that fair to you recently, huh? I think he loved you enough, my friend. If you think that he didn't love you enough, then you try to do what Jesus did, huh? You try that before you accuse him of something. Okay, let's go back to our main text here. Let's go back to our main text. It is also very interesting. Just, this is just a side note, just a bonus. All right, just throw it in there. But Judas Iscariot, who is supposed to be uh, the picture of the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is an imitator of Jesus Christ, who always mimics Jesus Christ. How did Judas Iscariot die, folks? He hanged himself on a tree. Interesting, right? 